in this presentation, we will consider some items in the book of Acts, chapters 1 through 5. We now see the apostles who will be running the church after Christ teaches them for a while. And in the book of Acts, we now see the gospel in action and see the growth of the church, the persecution, and the different things that happen to the church once Christ leaves. So with that in mind, the book of Acts is this book, as stated in its opening words, is the second of a two-part work where written to Theophilus. The first part is known to us as the book of Luke. The early part of Acts records some of the missionary, major missionary activities of the twelve apostles under the direction of Peter during the time immediately following the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The last half of the book outlines some of the travels and missionary work of Paul. It is evident that the book of Acts is not intended to be a comprehensive history of the early church but is mainly a recitation of the early missionary efforts and the important opening of missionary activity to people other than the Jews. A brief outline of the book is foreshadowed by Jesus' words in Acts 1.8, which says, Ye shall be witnesses unto, both of me, unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the other most parts of the earth. And that's from the Bible Dictionary. So, let's start with Acts chapter 1. Waiting upon the Lord. Waiting means to attend to, to perform, to look watchfully. So it's not just this passive sitting and waiting for things to happen, but waiting upon the Lord is to attend to the work of the Lord, to perform what he's asked us to form of, according to knowledge we have till then and to look watchfully for him and other things that he'd ask us to do. Psalms 37, 9 says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So those who attend to the things of the gospel, those who perform the works of righteousness, who look watchfully for things of the Spirit, will inherit the earth. Isaiah forty thirty one says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon wings of eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So again, waiting upon the Lord is a very active thing. It's not just passively sitting around waiting for something to happen. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour out upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with fire of my jealousy. And so we are to be active in attending to the works of the Savior and the things he asks us within his church to perform those things we are directed under by the Spirit and to look watchfully for the things of the Lord and for the signs of His coming. So, a number one example of waiting upon the Lord is Acts 1, verses 4 through 5 and verse 8. Follow the words of the Savior. 
Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5, And John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. But ye shall receive power from the Holy Ghost after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses both unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the Lord tells his apostles and disciples to wait at Jerusalem. And before you receive the further promises and power from the Father. Doctrine and Covenants, section 95, verses 8 through 9, refers to this there to wait in Jerusalem until they are endowed with power. It says, verse 8, Yea, verily I say unto you, I give unto you a commandment that you should build a house, in which house I design to endow those who I have chosen with power on high. This is where he's referring to the curtain and temple in the Doctrine and Covenants. But then verse 9 it says, For this is the promise of the Father unto you. Therefore I command you to tarry, even as mine apostles at Jerusalem. The endowment received in Kirtland included washings and anointings, as well as the washing of the feet for official priesthood brethren. The Lord also poured out his spirit, or in other words, endowed them with spiritual power, and many received revelations or other gifts. So one of the things the apostles' disciples were to do was to wait in Jerusalem until they received this power and gift and outpouring of the spirit from the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 1 through 4 the promise of the Father was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when all those present filled with the Holy Ghost, symbolized by the sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues like a fire set upon each of them. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, referring to this outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that they were waiting for, says this. With the closing of the old and the opening of the new dispensation, the Feast of Pentecost ceased as an authorized time of religious worship, and it is not without significance that the Lord chose the Pentecost, which grew out of the final Passover, as the occasion to dramatize forever the fulfillment of all that was involved in the sacrificial fires of the past. Fire is a cleansing agent. Filth and disease die in its flames. The baptism of fire which John promised Christ would bring means that when men receive the actual companionship of the Holy Ghost, then evil and iniquity are burned out of their souls as though by fire. The sanctifying power of that member of the Godhead makes them clean. In similar imagery, all the fires on all the altars of the past, as they burned the flesh of animals, were signifying that spiritual purification would come by the Holy Ghost, whom the Father would send because of the Son. On that first Pentecost of the so-called Christian era, such fires would have performed their purifying symbolism if the old order had still prevailed. How fitting it was instead for the Lord to choose that very day to send living fire from heaven, as it were, fire that would dwell in the hearts of men and replace forever all of the fires of all the altars of the past. And so it was that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. 
And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And so that is the promise of the Father that they were to wait for, is they are now given the gift and purifying, sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. And so that is one of the things they did to wait upon the Lord and to wait for him to perform this great outpouring of the Spirit which now gave the apostles and disciples the gift of the Holy Ghost to help and guide and direct their lives. And number two on waiting upon the Lord, a second thing is in Acts 1, chapters 9 through 11. The apostles looked watchfully as they see the Savior ascend into heaven in his glory and receive assurance of his divinity and that he would come again in like manner. We too can look and watch for spiritual experiences. So another thing that they did is that they saw the Savior ascend into heaven and gazed upon probably the glory and majesty that Christ displayed now that he's been resurrected. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland observed that Joseph Smith's first vision was one fulfillment of that promise. Jesus Christ and his Father, the God and Father of us all, appeared to the boy Joseph Smith in fulfillment of that ancient prophet, promise that the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth would again restore his church on earth and again come in like manner as those Judean saints had seen him ascend into heaven. Remember the angels that were there as they're gazing upon the Savior descends, and they said he will come in like manner, meaning in glory, and come back to the earth, and a partial fulfillment would be the first vision of when he comes in like manner, meaning down from heaven. A third thing is that they did that was waiting upon the Lord is Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. The apostles and disciples met together with one accord in prayer and supplication. And so again, we see this waiting upon the Lord that we're commanded to do involves doing the things he's already asked us and to continue them until we receive more instruction. And so they met together and prayed in one accord and became unified. A fourth thing is Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. Peter, as the head apostle, attended to the business of choosing a new apostle as guided by the Spirit. Because of the death of Judas Iscariot, there's an opening in the Quorum of the Twelve. And so Peter goes about the business of the church to perform the requirements that are needed for a new apostle. Gordon B. Hinckley said the following, Under the Lord's plan, those who have responsibility to select officers are governed by one overriding question. Whom would the Lord have? There is quiet and thoughtful deliberation, and there is much prayer to receive the confirmation of the Holy Spirit that the choice is correct. We have sustained this afternoon a number of newly called officers. We welcome each with love and pay respect. Among these is Rob, uh, Brother Robert D. Hells to become a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. He feels a vacancy made by the passing of our beloved friend and associate, Elder Marvin J. Ashton. In fulfilling that vacancy, each member of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve was at liberty to make suggestions. 
I am confident that in every case there was solemn and earnest prayer. A choice was then made by the First Presidency, again after solemn and serious prayer. This choice was sustained by the Council of the Twelve. Today, the membership of the Church and Conference assembled has sustained that choice. I give you my testimony, my brethren, that the impression to call Brother Hells to this high and sacred office came by the Holy Spirit, by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Brother Hells did not suggest his own name. His name was suggested by the Spirit. And so I can imagine similar things happened as they chose the new apostle under the direction of Peter and being guided by the Spirit. I hope you can see that this waiting upon the Lord is not just passively sitting waiting for something, but you're actively performing the duties that you have already been called to. You're attending to the work of the church and being watchful and mindful by the Holy Ghost and the Spirit. In Acts chapters 2 through 5, gifts or fruits of the Spirit flow from those who have been given and are worthy of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Following are some gifts of the Spirit that we now see in Peter and others as they now have been converted and sanctified by receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what follows next are examples of fruits of the Spirit that the leaders and the church have the Holy Ghost and it is the true, the true and living church upon the earth as we see now functions of the Holy Ghost operating. That's how you can tell the true church that will have fruits of the Spirit being displayed among its members. And so one of those is Acts 2 verses 4 through 12. The gift of tongues as manifested in speaking different languages was present as the apostles preached the gospel. And all those present from different countries were able to understand them in their own language. And so Peter preaches the gospel and as you look at verses 4 through 12, you'll see that they're from all different parts of the country around the area of the Middle East. But yet when he spoke, each one understood in their own language what he was teaching and preaching concerning Christ, baptism, and the covenant of following him. And that would have been one of the fruits of the Spirit. Number two, Acts 2, 14 through 36, Peter teaches and testifies of Christ with power and authority. You now see him endowed with the Holy Ghost. Peter is a very different person than what he was in the gospel, as he now has this power from the Holy Ghost. Number three, Acts 2, 37 through 41, the people are pricked in their hearts and exhibit faith by gladly receiving the word and were baptized. After Peter preached, the people said, what shall we do then? And Peter said, you should be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost and join his church. And so these Jewish people that were pricked in their hearts and received a witness by the power of the Holy Ghost, submitted to the will of God, and were baptized. Number four, Acts 2, verse 42. Had faith, have fa they had faith in and followed the apostles. Gaining a witness and following the apostles and sustaining them is, one of, is a fruit of the Spirit and a sign that the Holy Ghost is present in Christ's church. It's also a sign personally in your own life. If you have troubles following Christ's appointed apostles and having faith in them, 
then you may want to consider doing things that will help you receive the Holy Ghost because you have lost that gift if this is not manifested in your life. Elder Russ, M. Russell Ballard said concerning this, Are we listening, brothers and sisters? Are we hearing the words of the prophets to us as parents, as youth leaders, and as youth? Or are we allowing ourselves, as Naaman did at first, to be blinded by the pride and stubbornness which could prevent us from receiving and blessing blessings that come from following the teachings of God's prophets? Today, I make you a promise. It is a simple one, but it is true. If you will listen to the living prophet and the apostles and heed our counsel, you will not go astray. And so what a wonderful, beautiful gift of the Spirit. That is, if we will just heed and, and follow and be worthy of the Holy Ghost. Number 5, Acts 2, verse 43. There were wonders and signs, it says, that followed the apostles. This again shows that this is the true church, that the gifts of the Spirit have been bestowed and are functioning within the church. Number 6, Acts 2, 44 through 45. I would apologize for leaving that out. Members were able to live the law of consecration. They had some form of law of consecration in the united order, as it mentions in these verses, that they had all things in common to help the poor and the needy. Number seven, Acts 2, 46 to 47, and then chapter 4, verse 32. They were of one heart and of one soul continuing daily with one accord, meaning they were unified, they had unity. That's another fruit of the Spirit. And whose heart and soul are we to be one with? That is Jesus Christ. If we will all become of one heart and one soul with Christ, then we will come together in unity. That's a sign that the Holy Ghost is functioning in Christ's true church. If we are not becoming one and there is dissension and contention, then that means Satan has entered in and we are no longer having the gift of the Holy Ghost. Number eight, Acts 3, 1 through 7. Peter manifested the gift of healing. That is another sign and gift of the Holy Ghost that is exhibited in the true church. That a gift of the Holy Ghost is the gift of healing. And that was performed by Peter. President Harold B. Lee used the account of Peter healing the man at the temple gate to illustrate how to lift those around us. After reading Peter's words commanding the man to rise up and walk, President Lee said, Now in my mind's eye I can picture this man and what was in his mind. Doesn't this man know that I have never walked? He commands me to walk. But the biblical record doesn't end there. Peter just didn't content himself by commanding the man to walk but he took him by the hand, right hand and lifted him up. Will you see that picture now of that noble soul, that chiefest of the apostles, perhaps with his arms around the shoulders of this man and saying, Now, my good man, have courage. I will take a few steps with you. Let's walk together, and I assure you that you can walk because you have received a blessing by the power and authority that God has given us of men, his servants. Then the man leaped with joy. You cannot lift another soul until you are standing on higher ground than he is. You must be sure, if you would rescue the man, that you yourself are setting the example of what you would have him be. 
You cannot light a, light a fire in another soul unless it is burning in your own soul. So a great commentary on how Peter bends down and lifts the man up and helps him. We too must be on higher ground spiritually if we are going to lift others up into the gospel and help them. Number nine, another example of the fruit of the Spirit being exhibited in the church now is Acts 3, 12 through 26. Peter boldly testifies of Christ and calls to repentance those leaders of Israel who had the Savior crucified. Note that Peter calls on them to repent and be converted, but not to be baptized so that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Remember, with the first group of people on the day of Pentecost, he told them to repent and be baptized and become converted. Now he is addressing the rulers of Judaism who were behind getting Christ crucified. And his instruction to them is just to repent and be converted. He does mention nothing about being baptized. And here's why. Acts 3, 19-20 says, Repent ye therefore, and be forgiven, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So here is Peter, and the counsel he gave the Jewish leaders who were amongst those who instigated the crucifixion of the Savior. Notice that being baptized is left out in Peter's counsel to them. Joseph Smith explained why Peter only called upon the rulers who had crucified the Savior to repent and be converted, but not to be baptized. Joseph Smith taught that the doctrine of eternal judgment was perfectly understood by the apostles is evident from several passages of Scripture. Peter preached repentance and baptism for the mission of sins to the Jews who had been led to acts of violence and blood by their leaders. But to the rulers, he said, I would that through ignorance ye did it, as did also those ye shall come from presence. Let me try it again. I would that through ignorance you did it, as, also, as did also those ye ruled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing, redemption, shall come from the presence of the Lord. For he shall send Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you. The time of Redemption here had reference to the time when Christ should come. Then, and not until then, would their sins be blotted out. Why? Because they were murderers, and no murderer hath eternal life. Even David must wait for those times of refreshing before he can come forth and his sins be blotted out. For Peter, speaking of him, says, David hath not yet ascended into heaven, for his sepulcher is with us to this day. He re his remains were then in the tomb. Now we read that many bodies of the saints arose at Christ's resurrection, probably all the saints, but it seems that David did not. Why? Because he had been a murderer. Commenting on this same situation, as Peter is now teaching the rulers, the leaders of Judaism, who were behind the crucifixion of the Savior, Orson Pratt tells us this, confirming what Joseph Smith taught. Now let me bring up some instances from Scripture in regard to those, difficult, those different classes of individuals and the light knowledge which they had. 
Some may be forgiven, as I have already stated, in the world to come. Let me refer you to a certain class that are named in the scriptures that will be forgiven on certain conditions. You recollect that the Apostle Peter, having gathered around him a large congregation of Jews, the murderers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who had shed innocent blood, delivered that to them a discourse, but it was a very different one to that which he preached to the mixed multitude who had gathered from the different nations on the day of Pentecost. When he preached to the latter, he said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children and unto all that are afar off, even to as many as the Lord our God shall call. That was a true gospel sermon preached to individuals that were not guilty of murder. They were all required to repent, believe in Christ, to be baptized in water for the remission of sins, and they and all who were afar off who had received the gospel were promised the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost. But come to the other sermon to which I have referred, the one preached to the wicked and corrupt Jews who crucified Jesus. Peter said, We want not but what ye have done it through your ignorance. In other words, you have not received the Holy Ghost, and because you have not had the Spirit of the Lord resting upon you, you have shed the blood of the innocent one. You have murdered the Son of God, the Messiah, but you have done it through ignorance. Now the question is, was there any hope for them? Could they have their sins forgiven in this life? No. Peter, after telling them that they had shed the blood of the just one, in their ignorance, then tells them how and when they may obtain forgiveness. I will repeat the words. Repent ye therefore and be converted. No baptism here. Repent ye therefore and be forgiven that your sins may be blotted out when he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. He does not tell them to be baptized for the remission of sins. Why? Because he understood too well the nature of their sin. To tell them to be baptized for the remission of sin for the remission thereof. He knew they had lost that privilege in this world because they had shed the blood of the holy and just one. He said to them, If you repent now, you murderers, you have killed Jesus, the just and holy one, there is one hope that even your sins may be blotted out, not in this life, not by baptism for the remission of sins, but when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, whom the heavens will receive until then, and not even then, unless they repent while here in this life. This must have been sorrowful news to those to whom it was communicated, if they believed it. And so those rulers of Judaism who participated in the crucifixion of Christ, must wait until Christ comes again and must, I assume, would be suffering in hell that only until then, only until after he comes, must they wait in spirit prison because they consented to the murder of Christ. A tenth sign that the fruits of the Spirit were in the true church is Acts 4, verses 5 through 22. Peter and John are arrested and brought before the council of the Jewish leaders and told to stop preaching in the name of Jesus and threaten them. 
Peter and John fear God more than man and state, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard, the gift of courage and integrity. You see now Peter, very courageous and strong in his integrity, as this would be another example of him having the power and spirit of the Holy Ghost in his life. Number 11, Acts 4, verse 31. They are filled with the Holy Ghost and speak the word of God with boldness. And so we see again them exhibiting the gifts and powers of the Holy Ghost in their life. For number 12, Acts 5, through, Acts 5, verse 3. Peter has the gifts of discernment, knowing that Ananias had lied to him about keeping back part of the money that had been consecrated for the kingdom of God. So the discernment, the gift of discernment from the Holy Ghost is being exhibited. Number 13, Acts 5, verses 17 through 32. The apostles were put in prison, but were released by an angel of the Lord and were commanded to go and preach in the temple. There they, be, there they are again brought before the council and told not to teach in Jesus' name. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our Father raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay him. So here we see Peter miraculously released from prison by an angel and teaching again with power and authority and that he fears God more than man. That is a sign of a fruit of the Spirit. If we fear God more than what man can do us and we will submit to the will of the Father, then we know that the Holy Ghost is functioning in our lives. Now, chapter, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, is a good example of how open rebellion against God brings death. Here is the story. Verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? It's inferred here that they presented the money that they received, that this is everything that we received, and we present all of it to you where that they had actually kept back part of it for themselves. And Peter, through discernment, discerns and tells them, why have you lied to the ghost? Why are you saying you are giving your all when you have kept some back? Verse 5, while it, re while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So their lying is probably in saying this is the total sum when they had kept back part for selfish reasons. Verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on the, all them that heard these things. Verse 6, And the young men arose, wound, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. 
And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto it, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she down, then she, then then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carried her forth, and buried her by her husband. So in this case, their open rebellion against God and trying to lie to him about the money that they had received. God physically took them and showed that open rebellion brings death. In this case, it was a physical death. Look what it says on Mosiah chapter 15, verse 26, about open rebellion. But behold and fear and tremble before God, for you ought to tremble. For the Lord redeemeth none such that rebel against him and die in their sins. Yea, even all those that have perished in their sins ever since the world began, that have willfully rebelled against God, that have known the commandments of God and would not keep them, these are they that have no part in the first resurrection. So Mosiah is very clear that open rebellion in trying to deceive the Lord in our actions, in our offerings, and whatever we do in the church brings death. Now, it's not always physical. The worst is spiritual death. Being cut off from the presence of the Lord is far more damning than just physical death being cut off for a time. But open rebellion brings spiritual death. And we see it being operated in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, in a, in a very real physical way. Well, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.